Professor Michael Kimmage, who was Lionel Trilling? Lionel Trilling was the preeminent literary critic of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. He was born to a family of Jewish immigrants from Poland, educated in New York's public schools, and then spent his education and professional life at Columbia University, was uh, a literary critic of a kind that one can hardly imagine today in the sense that he had an absolutely enormous readership, had the highest level of esteem from his colleagues uh, and from fellow scholars and writers, but uh, also was able to engage a very large public. He was also associated with the word liberalism in ways that are quite uh, complicated, which in part meant, uh, especially by the 1940s, an affiliation with the Democratic Party, was once invited to the Kennedy White House and sort of feted there as a sympathetic intellectual uh, figure, but the connection ran deeper. He was uh, consistently engaged in his career in trying to determine what liberalism was, trying to argue for it, uh, and trying to make a case for it, not in political forms of argument, but in literary and cultural forms uh, what, of what's, argument. What do you mean? What's the difference? He was never somebody to write about party politics. He was never somebody to write about an election or a matter of foreign policy. For him, liberalism was a sensibility. It was an attitude, uh, a cultural posture. Uh, that had its roots in the 18th century, uh, in the thinking of uh, the Enlightenment in the 18th century, and was carried forward by poets and philosophers and writers in the 19th century, and was still very much a part of the 20th century. It was a cast of mind, a disposition, uh, skeptical, uh, secular in its basic outlines, uh, highly uh, invested in the life of the mind and the life of books, and also pluralist, a position that entertains multiple points of view and doesn't commit itself finally to any single point of view. Who was Whitaker Chambers? So Whitaker Chambers was, uh, to make the link from the very beginning, a classmate of Lionel Trilling's at Columbia in the early 20s, and so they were, uh, if not quite friends, associates at the same university as young men, but he was born into a very different world. His uh, family was uh, Protestant, loosely speaking, uh, and was sort of a declining middle-class family when he was born uh, into it, uh, and he made his way from that family to Columbia University where he rather quickly entered into radical political circles and joined the Communist Party without graduating. From there, the story is rather long and complicated. He was in and out of the party in the 1920s, uh, and by 1932, in a very interesting quirk of fate after publishing four short stories, was asked to rejoin the party formally, uh, not as an open member, but as a spy for the Soviet Union. Uh, this he was uh, until roughly 1937, and with all kinds of disputes about who he knew and when and what he did, uh, was affiliated with various espionage circles in Washington, D.C. in the mid-1930s. Most significantly, was affiliated with a man by the name of Alger Hiss, who was not front-page news in the 1930s, but a high-ranking government figure, uh, somebody who was uh, socially uh, intimate with the uh, Roosevelts and had worked in the State Department, other areas of government. By 1939, Chambers has broken with Soviet communism and become both a Christian uh, and an anti-communist uh, conservative. He proceeds in the 1940s to write for Henry Luce's Media Empire, where he's a star journalist, uh, editor of International News by the mid-1940s. And then as things start to heat up on matters of domestic anti-communism and communism after the Second World War, 1946-1947, he enters the public domain as somebody who accuses Alger Hiss of being a communist. This then becomes one of the major set-piece court cases of the early Cold War. It's the word of Chambers against the word of Hiss. Hiss was more handsome, he was better spoken, he was better uh, connected, and yet he seemed to be awfully evasive and uh, vague on many of the basic issues. Chambers was always described as rumpled, uh, overweight. Uh, there were allegations uh, of uh, homosexuality in the air at the time of the case, and so he felt uh, to many uh, viewers and watchers of the case to be a man on the margins. Uh, Chambers, you could say, won the case in the sense that Hiss was convicted not for espionage but for perjury and sent to jail for a time. He lost his government uh, position never to regain it. In the 1950s, uh, Chambers gave his version of the case uh, in his autobiography, 1952 autobiography, Witness, which is among the most significant books of the post-war conservative movement, a Bible for William F. Buckley Jr., for Ronald Reagan, for John Wayne, and many others who would declare themselves conservative in the post-war years. That's, I would argue, his most significant role. He's an early uh, 
instigator, you could say, of the conservative intellectual movement and participates in the founding of National Review in the 1950s, and then he dies uh, in 1961. So his career is, uh, politically speaking, vastly more important than Lionel Trilling's. Did Lionel Trilling and Whitaker Chambers remain friends and in contact throughout their lives? In contact, yes. Uh, even when Chambers was a spy, the two of them apparently had lunch at a vegetarian restaurant uh, in New York City, and they were aware of each other. Uh, I think after the early 1920s, they were not really friends. But the intriguing detail, for me at least, is that in 1947, at exactly the moment the Hiss case is beginning in public life, Trilling publishes a novel called The Middle of the Journey. And it's clear that one of the characters in the book is based on Whitaker Chambers. So Chambers appears in fiction, he appears in the public sphere at the exact same moment, and Trilling uses Chambers, you could say, as a symbol for the 1930s, as a symbol for the infatuation with communism, the movement away from communism, and also as a lens for looking at American society in the 1940s. Where are things going to go? In what direction are they going to travel? And the most interesting historical point that you can attach to this novel is that Trilling sees a new conservatism on the rise. This is 15 or so years before the candidacy of Barry Goldwater, uh, decades before the career of Ronald Reagan, and yet Trilling sees in 1947 a new conservatism on the horizon and attaches that conservatism to the figure of Whitaker Chambers. So an intriguing connection to be sure. What was Lionel Trilling's involvement with the Communist Party? This is difficult to characterize perfectly. He was never a member of the Communist Party. But there was a time, maybe it's 16 months, maybe it's two years, 1932, roughly, when he was emotionally very invested in the destiny, the political destiny of the Soviet Union. It was not a matter of public acts. I don't think that he went to many meetings or certainly didn't write anything on behalf of the Communist Party, but he felt this emotional <coughs> affiliation, and that you can sense in his book reviews and his writings at the time. Then, as with many in his generation, there's a break with that. And he's both self-critical and critical of the party, uh, and goes through a period of really rather extended disillusionment, uh, disillusionment I would say, from 1932 to 1941-42. He's reluctant, uh, when the Second World War begins, to endorse American involvement because he feels it might be uh, a kind of reassertion of American capitalism. So even in 1939, he's still quite uh, deeply in the radical orbit. By 1941, 1942, that's changed. And then by the end of the Second World War, he's going to be something approaching an establishment liberal voice. So a long progression for him. And for him and his career, the most important progression, political progression that he experienced. Michael Kimmage, in your book, titled Conservative Turn. What do you mean by that? The conservative turn is something that I feel uh, largely true for the time period. Uh, it's a two-part process. And the first part of the process, which is embodied in both biographies, is uh, a deep engagement with Soviet communism, not just with the left and not with just with progressivism, but with the actual uh, structure that you can call the Soviet Union and Soviet communism. Uh, and then there's a recoiling from that, which is something that you see all across the 1930s and happens in many different ways with many different consequences. One could write about this only within the history of the left, to be sure, but it felt to me in, in researching this subject that among the most crucial consequences was an uptick of uh, enthusiasm for conservatism broadly construed, uh, a kind of uh, atonement, as it were, for the sins of one's radical youth, uh, and so uh, a new kind of conservatism becomes possible. It's different in these two biographical cases. So for Chambers, it's an outright conservatism. There's a need to go back. There's a need to rediscover the links to Christianity. There's a need to rediscover the links to Western civilization and to assert this through a conservative political party. That's not what he felt the Republican Party was in the 40s and 50s, but he, he hoped that that's what the Republican Party would become. For Trilling, it's a balancing act. Liberals need conservatism to prevent themselves from going off the rails, as they had in the 1930s, in his view. So they have to balance themselves with this kind of conservatism, and that will keep them healthy uh, and stable. But in both cases, you see uh, a, a new connection to conservatism, and that's one that's going to play itself out, not just in the 40s and 50s, but really across the whole second half of the 20th century in the United States. And you mentioned uh, Lionel Trilling was a supporter of JFK. Yes. He was a card-carrying Democrat uh, from the moment he deconverted from socialism uh, to his death in 1975. Uh, never voted for uh, 
uh, a Republican and conservative as he could have